Welcome, this is the Kirkwood School District. Look at Adams and their role in sixth grade science. Today's goal is students will be able to identify parts of the atom and how those different parts of the atom play a role in the periodic table, as well as electricity, both static and current electricity. When we're thinking about this, we're gonna take a look at the atom. Now the word atom means, in Greek, uncuttable. The atom was believed as the, or the, the smallest item known to man. We know now that science has proven that that is not actually the case. The atom is the smallest particle, though, of every element, and the concept of element is going to be crucial for our understanding of not only the periodic table, but also properties of those elements on the periodic table in order for us to determine what we can learn about electricity. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into any other substance by physical or chemical means. This means that if you have an element, you cannot cut it down any smaller to make it anything else other than that element. And an element is one of over 100 basic materials that make up all matter. Not the Honda element, that's a totally different thing. Now, there are many atomic theories, and we're going to take a look at a, a couple of them as we go through this video. The first one we take a look at is the fact that we're going to take a look at Dalton's atomic theory. That was sort of the foundation. And we had these series of models that changed as science grew better, as technology grew better, and we're really not even going to get into the current model of what the atom looks like because we're just going to basically focus on how that model has changed over time and what we've learned from it. So there are four parts of Dalton's atomic theory. So here's the first part. All elements are composed of atoms that cannot be divided. Now, when you're thinking about that, we know that to be sort of true because all elements are composed of atoms. That's great. But the cannot be divided part, we can't agree with anymore. We have, with technology, been able to divide an atom into even smaller parts or even split an atom. Dalton's second theory was that all atoms of the same element are exactly alike and have the same mass. Atoms of different elements are different and have different masses. This is sort of partially true. What Dalton learned is that if you have a whole bunch of atoms of gold, they're all gold, but they're not all exactly alike. Now, what he, is, what he did find out is that atom of gold is very different than that atom of hydrogen, for example. So atoms of different elements are different and do have different masses. An atom of one element cannot be changed into an atom of a different element. Atoms cannot be created or destroyed in a chemical change. They can only be rearranged. This is absolutely awesome and correct. The atom of one element cannot be changed into an atom of a different element. I can't take hydrogen and whoa, change it into oxygen. Can't happen. Okay, We can react that in some way, shape, or form to create oxygen through a chemical reaction, but we cannot make hydrogen disappear and reappear as oxygen. It's not going to work. It doesn't happen. So this is a great, true statement. Adams, Dalton's last part, the fourth part, says every compound is composed of atoms of different elements combined in specific ratios. This is exactly true. We learn this because when we look at water, for example, we know water is H2O. That means there are two parts hydrogen for every one part oxygen. No matter what compound or molecule of water we look at, we get the same ratio. All right. Now, if we change that ratio ever so slightly and get H2O2, meaning two hydrogens, two oxygens, then what that means is we get a totally different compound. That compound's called hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has very different properties than water. Now, moving from Dalton, we took what Dalton learned and added to it when Thompson found out a different, different theory of what the atom looks like. His theory was what's called the plum pudding model. And what he believed is he believed when the atomic model was laid out, there was sort of a, a cloud, if you will, that had sort of positive pieces around in it, 
with some negative pieces around in it, similar to if you imagine like a, like a cookie. Now, back in the day, they didn't have a whole lot of cookies back in J.J. Thompson's day. So he related to what's called plum pudding. You see a picture of plum pudding right here on the screen. It doesn't look very appetizing. Expanding on Thompson's model was Rutherford. And Rutherford found through an investigation where he kind of shot a beam at a, a piece of foil that there was something in, in an atom that actually would allow that beam to either reflect or bounce off of uh, a, a piece of that. So he found this positively charged center of the atom that would actually change the direction of that beam. And what he found was he found what was called the nucleus. The nucleus is the center of the atom and it's positively charged. So now if you kick those two things together, you start seeing that there's this negative thing floating around the outside. There's this center, more dense, positively charged thing. And we start getting uh, an idea of what this atom's going to look like. Now, as time went on, uh, protons were discovered. And protons are positively charged particles in the center of the atom. So once again, you still have the negatively charged outside parts, but now you have these positively charged uh, particles around the inside, but we still don't know what these other things are that, are, that make up an atom. Once again, time went on, the model of the atom continued, and there was a determination that actually electrons have sort of an area where they, where they sort of combine and, and where they sort of hang out, if you will. And that, that area where they hang out is called an energy level. So, for example, some electrons stay closer to the nucleus and some electrons stay farther away from the nucleus. And, and where they kind of group up in those different energy levels uh, kind of dig determines how much energy that, that electron may have, all right? Now, when we're thinking about the last part, we're thinking about what's called a neutron. And a neutron is a neutrally charged particle found in the center of the nucleus. We've got ourselves a bogey. Is this? Anticipate visual contact now. Hey, that's Jimmy Neutron. Huh? That's not the neutron we're talking about. What? Wait, 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 wait. What's going on here? Not that. We're not talking about that kind of neutron. We're talking about the neutron in the nucleus of the atom. The neutron is the neutrally charged particle found in the nucleus. So you see, protons are positively charged in the center. Neutrons, neutrally charged in the center. They just made them different colors to kind of help you out. And electrons are surrounding the nucleus in that sort of cloud energy level type situation. Now, where we use this in chemistry and electricity is we have the periodic table of elements. We see all the huge lists of elements, but what we can do is we can actually go into the periodic table and pull out some very valuable information about what the atom looks like. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, one thing you're going to find is you're going to find what's called the atomic number. It is a unique number of protons found in the nucleus of the atom. The atomic number of protons in an atom, those two things distinguish one atom from the other. So here's an example. Helium, H-E, is the symbol. It is an atomic number of two. So if we were to draw the atom, helium, we would label it with two protons, okay? Now, another example would be the element lithium, right over here. Its atomic number is three. Now, since its atomic number is three, it has three protons in the nucleus. So you can see how two protons tell me helium, three protons tell me lithium. We also have on the periodic table what's called the mass number or what's called the average atomic mass. It is a sum of the number of protons and neutrons found in the nucleus. It is an average. So that means that there are more than one kind of that specific element that has different number of neutrons. And what they do is they simply find out how many of them are, there are, add them up, and find the mean or the average. So since the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons, we can actually just do a little math and we take the protons and the neutrons and the mass and try to figure out how many exist. So let's take a look at nitrogen. 
Nitrogen here has an atomic number of seven. It has a little seven right there. So that means it has seven protons. So seven plus what will give me the number here, which is 14.01, the mass number. Well, seven plus seven equals 14. But what about the 0.01? Well, for these purposes, we're gonna eliminate the decimal and just simply round it to the nearest whole number, all right? Because you can't have like 0.1 of 0.01 of either a proton or a neutron. That doesn't make sense. So we just simply go seven plus what gives us 14? And we know seven plus seven gives us 14. So nitrogen is an atom that has seven protons and seven neutrons. Now, when we think about how we're gonna use this, in chemistry, we use the atomic structure as the key to understanding how the periodic table is organized, the properties of specific elements, and the propensity to, to form compounds with other elements or not form compounds. When we think about how we use this in electricity, we're gonna be using this to look at the kind of the elect part, which is the electron part of electricity, and we're going to examine the role that that electron plays in various materials just to see if we can use that knowledge to really understand what's happening in the areas of both static and current electricity. All right, in this video, we wanted you to be able to identify parts of the atom and how those parts of the atom play a role in the periodic table as well as our unit of electricity. I've got a video to wrap it up. Please check it out. Atoms are divided into two major parts, a centrally located nucleus that contains positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons, and one or more orbitals, regions in the space surrounding the nucleus in which negatively charged particles, called electrons, travel about continuously at nearly the speed of light. Protons and neutrons each have a mass approximately 1,836 times greater than that of electrons. However, in spite of the huge difference in mass between protons and electrons, their electrical charges, though opposite, are equal in magnitude. As atoms have equal numbers of protons and electrons, they are electrically neutral. Every element has a unique atomic number. The atomic number of an element corresponds to the number of protons found in the nuclei of its atoms. For example, hydrogen atoms have one proton and an atomic number of one. Helium atoms have two protons and an atomic number of two. While carbon atoms, which form the atomic skeleton, of all the larger molecules found in living organisms have six protons in their nucleus, giving them an atomic number of six. While every atom of a given element has the same number of protons, the number of neutrons contained in the nucleus of atoms of the same element can vary. For example, carbon atoms can have four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine neutrons. Each of these different forms of carbon is referred to as an isotope. Isotopes of a given element like carbon are virtually identical to one another in terms of chemical reactivity, but sometimes vary in their physical properties. For example, the nuclei of some isotopes, called radioactive isotopes, spontaneously disintegrate, releasing radiation in the process. In the case of carbon, the isotopes carbon-12 and 13 are stable, while carbon isotopes 10, 11, 14, and 15 are radioactive. The existence of radioactive isotopes in carbon and other elements allows scientists to carry out tasks as different as dating the fossil remains of long dead organisms to studying the physiology of the human mind. However, it is the behavior of electrons in an atom's outer orbitals that determines how the ions and molecules critical to life are formed.